Welcome to the View Magazine's Rebel Justice Podcast. Today we'll be talking to Deborah Kayembe, Rector of the University of Edinburgh. Deborah was in her 20s, just starting her career when she was forced to leave her home country, Congo, in order to survive. She came to the UK and was lucky enough to find kind-hearted people that gave her the support she needed. Being aware of how hard it is for refugees and immigrants when they're coming to the UK, she dedicates herself to give them the support they lack and are in much need for. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, <laughs> I have so many hats <laughs> in my life, but I like people to recognize me as a political activist and a human rights campaigner. My background is a lawyer. I went to law school. I practice the common law and both specialize in international criminal, co- criminal law. Refugees and migrants is something I have worked tirelessly because I have a background as a refugee myself. I came in this country back in 2005 and I was an asylum seeker then. So I went to the journey for being an asylum seeker, granting refugee in the country, stay here permanently, applying for citizenship. That's my journey. That's that's just great. Can you tell us more about your experience as a political refugee? Mm, mm-hmm, mm. Back in, 2000, in 1994, in my home country in the Congo, we had to open the door to the Rwandan who had genocide in their country. 1994, we opened the door to 2 million refugees who came to our country, but Congo was always a poor country. So receiving overnight over over 2 million refugees was a big burden for us. And it has changed our lives because new people were coming with new way of living. We as a country, we were suffering, we were in the, it was difficult. Then at that time, I started my first contact with the refugees. In my homeland, refugee came surviving the worst killing in human history. So there were scars, many scars on those people. But again, living side by side with the newcomer in the country become very difficult. So we have to face huge amount of massacre in DRC. It's, it's, it's that time I was just becoming able to practice as a lawyer in my country. So... We then had to survive, you know, very difficult time with a president leaving the country, a new president coming, the new president arrived, is assassinated. So the country is in complete chaos and we need to reconstruct that. That's when the country appointed me as a special envoy of the president of the Commission of Human Rights. As a special envoy, I have to help the Human Rights Commission to establish the massacre that happened in my country. So this is where I started to have my first contact with refugees. Horrible stories, horrible stories. When I met my first report to establish who did what, I had been attacked, first of all, and then death threats. From there, a 29 years old younger lawyer closed my back, left the country without anything with me, just because he was instant. Someone just called me and said, if you don't leave the country right now on your way back, You'll be taken and they will have you killed. So I left the country. I end up in the UK, this time myself as an asylum seeker and a refugee. A different experience, well established looking after the refugee, but in a new country, in a new place. With the hope for me, it was, oh, here is the country of human rights, the United Kingdom. Everybody sees the human, the United Kingdom as the place where everybody respects the right of the individuals. Okay, let's arrive in the UK. <laughs> I, I arrived in the UK, I was 29, very little English because my first language is French, Swahili and Lingala and Kikongo, the language for which I was brought up. I speak seven languages. Oh so English God. was my sixth language and I was just learning it, you know? <laughs> Six languages, oh my God, that's impressive. That's so impressive. Oh yeah, but on that day, at King Cross Station, when those agents who helped me to travel abandoned me, I felt small like you never believe. I felt that, where is this place? It's, it's the 25th of February, 2005, and it's already dark at 2 p.m. and I have no coat, it's so cold. I don't know 
who to speak to, where to go. And I'm crying like a child because they, these people abandoned me there at the station mm -hmm. until the police managed to take me to, this, to where we're supposed to claim asylum. Well, I spent the night outside. I slept outside. Mm -hmm. In the morning, they call me. When they call me and I can't feel my legs, I can't feel my arm. I am seven months pregnant, you know, my first pregnancy. So I am shaking like so someone has been in the fridge for a while. So they give me a, a light blanket and they said, you cannot take the elevator. Go to the stairs until you get to the level six. Then someone will get you there for your interview. I can't even feel my foot. How can I walk to get to the stairs at, until level six? I get to every stairs I was going, I was crying, crying, sat back on the stairs, up again, crying, crying until I get to the door. Someone was there waiting for me. He catches me by them and the hands. And he said, sit here. We are going to listen to you. Nine o'clock in the morning until seven in the evening, 10 hours of interrogation. Why did you come to the UK? What was your target? The name of your family, your father, your sister. I was being interrogated like I was a criminal. Like I came in this country to destroy these people. I told them it was not the substantial interview. It was just the interview where you have to tell why you came. At the end of the interview, I said, why are you treating me like a criminal? I came here to seek asylum in your country. I came here to ask you to protect me. That's all I'm asking you. And I wanted the world to know what happened in my country. So then the following day, I was so ill that I went to the hospital. So the whole process was that. I went through the journey. Two years later, I struggled to get the right to stay in the UK. Two years later, I was granted a refugee, but with the support of one of the Labour MP, Jack Straw, because he did help me uh, to get that, because my, my asylum was just not believed, like many asylums of people seeking in this country. Then I was sent to the north of England when I stayed. Two years later, granted refugees. I decided to, to, to work myself as an interpreter to help the others, because many of the problem I had throughout the journey was how these interpreters, the immigration had, was interpreting my story. I had the belief that they did not say exactly what I have said, you know. So I become an interpreter on my own right, helping as voluntarily. Then I went quickly working for the UK border agency, working for the prison, working for the court. And that's how I knew how to fight this system that exists, that Nothing else than to humiliate human beings, humiliate them just because they're seeking protection. It doesn't that from today. It started from the time I arrived. Even now I know it was even before me, when the Jews came here, they had problems too. I imagine. Do you think that anything has changed since when you came here? No, it has gotten worse. It has got, I remember at my time, when you seek asylum, you have, I was a pregnant woman. I was re receiving 35 pounds per week for ration. So that means they give you 35 pounds to buy food only. You have no right to television. You have no right to radio. No, you have no right on all these things. They give you a house with the, the, the government paid the electricity. But now it's no longer the case. It's not an obligation for the government to give you electricity. TV and now single people survive with 15 pounds per week. It's worse. It's worse than my time when I arrived. It's far worse. But now, now I'm, I'm with the University of Edinburgh. I'm preparing a, a conference on refugees and the link with God, with God. And there was a book I'm reading. There's a book I'm reading right now about, about the story of a German Jew who is white, white just like you. And he came in the UK during the Second World War. And I read the way he, his story in detail and the way he was treated, nothing has changed. I mean, back then, this thing was happening, it was quiet. They were respecting people who were going through the system, so no one was making it public. Now it's become a subject of praise. You know, someone who's, he was bad against somebody, praise himself for being bad against somebody. You know, it's all together, the, the behavior, the policy, and the individual that brings this policy and showing what they're doing. And they're not, they don't, they're not even afraid on showing that to people. So there is no more compassion now. It's all gone. Why do you think these attitudes have changed like towards refugees? Why do you think they have changed? I have to admit something which is absolutely true. 
9-11 changed many things. You know, 9-11 in America mm-hmm. changed many things. And then in London in 2005, the bombing in King's Cross changed many mentality. That is this problem. And when I try to make a comparison between the attitude that people are having here in the UK and the attitude we had in DRC when we opened the door to the refugees, mm-hmm. we opened the door to the refugee and we take them as, as family. Now we have 12 million dead in DRC, 12 million. Why? Because we fail to control our border properly, okay? Now, here there was an attack in London, there was an attack uh, uh, in 9-11. We, be- we went very aggressive against these people. And what happened is we went in Syria. We went to Syria, Iraqi first. We went to Iraqi. We did a war in Iraqi. We made 2 million more refugees. We went to Syria. We made a war to Syria, one more refugees. Then we went to, to Afghanistan where we stay like, for two, like forever, like we never be, we leave. And then suddenly we're leaving. The Afghans are coming again. I think that the problem here is that we need to put in place policy that is working and that's sustainable, okay? Making policies that are aggressive, you only receive aggressivity in return. Making policy that are making hatred, you're only going to receive hatred in exchange. So each and every country has a conscience that national security is a priority. But you can't deal with national security when you are very mean to the others. So the mistake you made, you have to pay for it one day. That, that is the reality. So whoever is, we are afraid for them to come to the UK, whoever, we are afraid for them not to attack us, we need to do our work properly. And when you look at the work the immigration has done, I've been working with them side by side. It was always wrong, always wrong. The policies are wrong. The way of integrating people, are, it's just engage more hatred, more hatred, more hatred. And that is bad. I keep asking myself, can we not leave this country at peace? No bringing war to them? Let them put their own democracy or put their own way of living? Who do you think will leave his home to come to another home to get mistreated? It's not, it, it doesn't happen this way. So I think it's our policies. It's the policies that we're creating in the country and outside the country. That is the consequence of all the trouble we're having now. Can you think of uh, any other human rights abuses that uh, refugees who seek asylum in the UK face? What, what is the, the, the I mean, the, all the basic human right is denied to asylum seekers and refugees in this country, okay? First of all, an asylum seeker in this country cannot work, is prohibited to work. You have somebody who is intelligent, who is talented, he cannot work, okay? The immigration said, we will feed you while your asylum case is going through. Four months later, you stop the 15 pound. You make him destitute. What is, where is his right? of living in dignity. You take that right away from him. Look at the refugees. You are a refugee, that means that you have a right to live in the UK and to work in the UK. But the minute you become a refugee, all the support of the government is stopped. So the right to the basic life is stopped to you because you have to find, find it yourself. For someone like me, who went to school until university in French, Every university I went to find a space to get a placement as a student was refused to me. They said to me, because your knowledge of English is not good enough for the university level. And if I just have to stick for what they're saying, maybe today I won't be the woman I am today. So they, 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 all the basic right, the inherent right that is recognized for all refugees is not for the refugees in this country. You have a child who is an asylum seeker. He's allowed to go to primary school and secondary school. When she reaches secondary school and she's is about to go to, to university, it cannot go to university until she got the right to stay in the UK. So that means an asylum seeker, a child of an asylum seeker born here, will go to primary school, secondary school, as long as he doesn't got the status to be a refugee in the UK, your education stopped right there. That's a violation of human rights. 
you cannot go to university because you don't have the title of refugee or you don't you don't have leave to remain in the UK. All the right that is allowed to every human be the basic one for refugees and asylum in this country are not there. Name it, just name it. The right to be married. You are an asylum seeker, you cannot be married in this country. Even though you fall in love with someone you love so much and that person does, does want you as a wife, you cannot marry. So where is the right of people here? A lot of your activism works to combat racism. Mm. How much does racism play a part in the UK's response to refugees? Oof. I think it's the basic layer. It's the layer of everything with refugees uh, in the UK. It's the layer of everything. So it's 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 like that's that's a refugee. It's a criminal. That's the first reaction. Why is he a criminal? Because he's not like us. Because he was not born here. Because he's is is not white enough to be uh, one of us. You know what is what is more shocking now. You see, yes, two days ago, we have a prime minister who was born here, but is not white, he's Hindu. Do you see how people are talking about him all over the media? It's not British, it's not one of us. The, the, the thing that politics and, and policies in, in the UK is based on race, it's fundamental. It's based on race. It's just the race of people. If, if you are somebody who... <laughs> who is from the black minority and you get a position, a strong position, you can either be the slave or don't want to serve them or not to listen to them because they'll ask you to do exactly what you've been told because they're the one who think that they put you where you are. It's very difficult, I'm telling you. The racism is the heart of everything, whether you are a refugee or not, it's the heart of everything in this country. But it gets worse with the refugee because they are refugees. Mm -hmm. Politicians use that for the agenda. The agenda of many politicians here is to fight the immigration. The refugees are coming to take your husband. The refugees are coming to take your wife. The refugees are coming to take your job. Really? Th that is the reality. I mean, the reality of this country is all about race. And once you try to confront people saying race is the problem here, it's nothing else, just the race and the hatred and the fear that what you have done to the other in the past might return to you, people think you're a bad person because you're telling them the truth. Do you think that politicians create these cruel policies towards refugees to win votes or do they actually believe it? If they do not believe it, why are they, they using it to get to power? It's not only in the in the UK those things happen. It's happened recently in Italy. The new Prime Minister of Italy, she's far right. She comes with an agenda of saying that we don't want the immigrants here. We want we want Italy for the Italian. You know, politicians are the the one who create all these unpopular policy po policies. I cannot say unpopular. I, I call them you know un, undignified uh, policies, and they just. Very, very populist, you know, the right wing like populist things to make people go, to make people disappear. And it has worked even in Africa or even here in Europe. Politician lacks that because at this moment in time, there is this movement of trying to say we need to protect ourselves because the economy is not safe, because COVID is still here. Every excuse is good for them to distract people. But it's never been like this always. In some places, even here, when I came here 18 years ago, when it was the, the Labour Party, it's true, it was tough for, for us to, to be an asylum seeker. But it was far better than today. Okay? And then people were much kinder. You know? Even you see people dying on the sea. You know, they're blocking the sea, the people dying and coming here. They said, well, if, if, we, if we control the channel, people no not come again. The reality is this. These people know that the government in every European country will never welcome them. But why they're still coming? Because of ordinary people like you and I. You know, they know people on the street will give me a bread. People on the street will give me a clothing. They're coming because they know ordinary people exist. If it's just for the government, they will never come. So they're coming for the hope that there are better people. Um, absolutely. They are coming because they are convinced, even though there is this policy, but ordinary people with good hearts, they are. And if they find just one in the way, they're lucky. 
But I was very lucky because I found 20. And these people gave me the strength I needed to survive and to get stronger very quickly and to win what I have won today. Because I had many of them around me ready to support me. Do you think that if you would have come, I don't know, let's say last year, mm -hmm. do you think you would have at least a similar experience to? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I have to say many now, many and many ordinary people have become very skeptical about supporting other people. Where this specialism come from? Why are people becoming more and more indifferent? It's because of suffering. You know, the economy is not well. The cost of living is not well. Can you abandon your children to help the stranger on the street? No. Right now in this country, it's already difficult for homes to afford electricity or gas. Right now in this country, there are families that cannot afford to, to have a toast. Yesterday, I went to visit my own students. They're sleeping on the bank, on the bank bed. That is the first big university in the UK. On the bank bed, why? Because their parents could not afford to send them the money on time to pay the rents. You see how bad it is. So I think more suffering make people very indifferent in terms of helping. If people have the minimum for themselves, they can make a little sacrifice to help the others. But when you are suffering already, and that is what this government has been doing for the last 10 years with the spending cut, with the, the inflation, with the, the tax rising, people have become more preoccupied for their own lives and their own future instead of helping the person who is on the street. That is the politic of our government. But they are richer and richer every day. Today we have a prime minister is twice richer than the king. Honestly. A lot of what we hear about the refugees that come from the media or the government. Hmm. Do you think the perception would change if the refugees were given a platform to speak? First of all, give a platform to speak to a refugee is a good thing because no one in this world deserve to be silent, you know, no one. If the politician has the voice to speak and to say, the refugee also have the same right, that is a basic human right. Mm -hmm. I think what is important is to allow the refugee to fulfill what they want to do and to give them a little uh, measure to help them to survive their, the difficulty they are, they are going through. Imagine, refugees left their home dramatically You know, during the, the, the takeoff of the Taliban in Afghanistan, I saw the refugee coming in the plane in England on barefoot, no bag, no pepper, barefoot. I mean, I don't know what happened in Kabul, how did they manage to get into the plane? They landed in the UK barefoot. That's all they have, standing, no shoes, nothing. And you ask, did you come with somebody? She can't remember whether she was with the mother, with the father, she can't remember anything, the, the poor girl. And you realize how difficult it is for these people already to stand on their own and surviving the atrocity they have survived, then to come to an hostile environment where they've been questioned, why did you come? Why did you this? What? But who destroyed Afghanistan? It's not the Afghan people, no. So that is the reality. It, it gets, you have the impression that people will change the attitude to refugees, but I think refugees also have the right to have a place to, to speak and to tell the world their own experience. Perhaps that will help many people to understand their position. If you ask a woman like me who achieved so much in the UK, what I would like to do is to return to DRC, to my homeland. My, my, home, my home has been in war two weeks ago. The, the war started again in, in the Congo two weeks ago. How do I go back? Tell me. Hmm? You know, a year ago, I became rector of university. My country was waving to see me, looking to see me. Now I don't even know how to get to a plane because there's a war in my country. How <laughs> do I go back? Hmm. You know, so it's it's painful. You know, it's very. I have two children, 15 and 16, and they never went home. They never seen the Congo. Who can live like this? Who can live like this? You know, I was actually going to ask if you ever returned back home. No, I'm not, I haven't returned in the Congo for 18 years. I've been here since 2005, here day and night, never put my feet back home. Last year, with my election as rector of University, the whole country celebrated. Many 
even thought I was dead and they realized I was still alive. So it was a celebration that you had never uh, realized. Now, the war has started again. How can I go back? And in a country like this, you wonder, should I take the children I raised here to bring them to see this trauma? You know, the thing is this government, they're not make, even making no effort for us refugee to let us return to a peaceful country. They bring, we here and our country is still being destroyed, destroyed. Do you see an Iraqi person return to Iraqi in Iraq? Or do you see today the Iranian girls return to Iran? It's just chaos. Can you tell us a bit more about your work you're doing as director of the University of Edinburgh? Okay, the director of the University of Edinburgh is an elected member of the university court. So the university court is the most powerful organ of the university. My role is to make sure that the university is governed properly. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at the budget of the university. I look at how much money has been allocated to this. How much. That's the first role. The second role is to look after my students and my staff together. If you are someone who works at Edinburgh University and you have a problem with someone within the university, you write to me to say, Madam Rector, I've done this, I've done this, but this person did to me, did this to me. So my role is like an ombudsman. I'll come in between and say, I need to make this fix correctly. That's how it is. But when I come to the university, I bring an agenda like any university, any rector. So the university will need to follow this agenda. And for me, it was equality, diversity, and inclusion. So it was that we stick in this society, we respect each other. We combat discrimination. We give the chance to the people who are disadvantaged. So if we have children who want to go to public normal school and they want to come to the University of Edinburgh, I will make sure that these students make it. You know, I will never let them down because this is why they elected me for. So it's a role for three years and I'm due to finish my, my tenure in 2024, in February 2024. But in the meantime, I still campaign for equality, diversity and inclusion. So LGBT's issue. Uh, all other issues of human rights in, in our society and abroad, because the University of Edinburgh is a big institution. So we highlight them because I have a voice, my voice, which is always the voice of the, the, the teller of the uncomfortable truth. I've always tell the uncomfortable truth to people because I want to see this change. Did you get involved in helping the Ukrainian refugee situation? Mm, okay. The University of Edinburgh is the first university in this country to be the university of sanctuary. That means that when refugees come into this country, we give them special option to come to the university to continue their education, even though they don't have a paper to stay in the country. Because of the situation that happened in, in Ukraine, many came and they did not have to go to the immigration process. Mm -hmm. But again, I have to say this to you, it's chaotic because some came and they did get some temporary stay paper from the immigration, but some came until today, they never had anything. But when it comes to the university, we don't pay attention to that. We give them the option to come to study at Edinburgh University. What I have experienced as rector of Edinburgh University is that I hear many people, even celebrities, I have raised 2 million, I have raised 20 million, I have raised but I still have students at Edinburgh University who are struggling to pay for the education. And that makes me very frustrated. You know, we have a new scheme at Edinburgh University where, where the UK government pay 30% and the Scottish government need to pay 70% of the study. And that 30% that the UK government is paying is a loan. It's not a gift. Mm -hmm. So imagine a refugee who came from Ukraine with all the trauma, losing all the money, you give her a tuition fee of 30, 35,000 pounds. 35,000 pounds. That's the fee. Okay? Then you take 30% of it, you give her as a loan. That's the UK government. And the Scott is supposed to pay the 17. And every student at Edinburgh University, the Scottish government has not paid yet until today. So I am very frustrated and I am very angry. Because they got on TV, they're pretending, for, for me now it's pretensions. You pretending that we're going to help the student, we're going to support the student, and they don't get that support. It's not there. And the thing is, 
if today Putin stop all the war, everything stop, and all the support around them will stop too, because they are temporarily because of the war. Do you realize that? A girl go to university to study only one year. Edinburgh University only give one year for the student you can to study, and that costs you 35,000 mm-hmm. pounds, one year. And then during that one year, the, the, the UK government give you a loan that goes direct, directly to the university account. You're still struggling to find the 70% left, okay? And then one morning, Mr. Putin said, there is no more war, the UN can go back. Do you imagine what's going to happen to this student? She's going to abandon her study or the effort back to Ukraine. I'm going to have to tell you something. This help, they're saying they're helping the Ukrainian student. They're just not sustainable. They're not sustainable. And they're just not helping properly. That's the problem. What do you think should be done in order to avoid this chaos around the... I think our politicians need to be honest with themselves, not to pretend making public uh, promises that they don't hold. You know, people need to have some kind of dignity to address this issue. You can't just go there because you want everybody to see you as a good person and you say, but all the Ukrainian students can come here, we pay for the education. No, that is not true. At Edinburgh University, it is not true. I have experienced that. Some could afford to pay because probably they came with their money and they're hoping they can refund them the money. Those who could not come with any money, they're still struggling. And I keep saying this on every media. Why are you going on TV saying, I've raised money for the Ukrainian? We need money at the university for the students. Come pay for the students. Hmm? What are your thoughts on how people reacting to the Ukraine refugees in the UK and... Hmm. Mm. Did you observe any differences made between Ukrainians and others seeking refugee in the UK? Yes, yes. As rector of Edinburgh University, I survived two crises. I survived the Afghan crisis and the Ukrainian crisis. When we go back to the Afghan crisis, nobody cares. I mean, I'm telling you, nobody cares. As rector... I could not sleep at night to make sure with my little influence I have on that world, personally, to help the stu- the, my students. When it comes to the Ukraine, people seem to say, really, we want the Ukrainian, we want to help the Ukrainian. And what I saw, it's much more ordinary people giving space to them. You know, some people say, I have a room in my house which is empty, come and stay, I have two rooms here which I never saw before. So the Ukrainian had that from ordinary people. Mm-hmm. My issue here is our government because their government are saying, we're giving this, we're giving this, we give, but that is something I did not see. So there is a difference here. No, nothing was given to the Afghan, nothing was given to the Congolese because the Congolese is the greatest genocide in the world, 12 million dead. Nothing, but they're still coming around the world, no attention, but there was attention from Ukrainian. And for the Ukrainian, the people, the population was quite kind. You know, they opened the doors for them. But opening the door to someone, is that enough? Are you going to open the door to someone in your, in your house for 20 years? I'm still wondering until now, with this crisis, this living crisis, Do you think these people are still having the Ukrainian in their homes? Because many of the scheme, many of the scheme that the government did then did not work. Some more people signed up for the scheme. They said they never received the money from the government. So this is the situation. It's just not honest and it's just not respectful of people. Simple as that. Definitely. Do you think it's a racism situation as well? Racism, as I told you before, is the basic of all. This country is run based on race, nothing else. It's based on race. What shocked me when I came to Scotland, it was, okay, I've seen racism in England, and that racism was black, white. You white, I'm black, we racist. Different color skin. But when Brexit came, I saw a different kind of racism, (laughs) you know? They were racist against people who look white just like you. I say, what? We we don't have that in Africa. In Africa, as long as you're African, it's enough. Whatever is your color, it's enough. 
But here during Brexit, people become racist against the Polish, racist against Hungarian, racist against the Spanish. And I said, what? What kind of racism is that? But it does exist. Mm -hmm. It does exist. This country is merely based on race. It's all about race. This is how I work in this country. Even though when you, you go to socialist, you know, you go socialist parties, you have socialist people here, we are from the left. I am from the left and I can tell you, racism is there as much as in the right. I can tell you that. Yeah, definitely. Finally, can mm -hmm. you tell us what you're working on next? Is there mm -hmm. a campaign you'd like to tell our listeners about in case they would like to get involved? Mm -hmm. First of all, there is a campaign I'm launching right now. That I, I've been on the campaign before becoming rector at Edinburgh University. That is the Freedom Work campaign. You can find everything about the Freedom Work campaign on Twitter and on Facebook. There is a page there. The Freedom Work campaign was really an anti-racist campaign and the civil rights movement, the first one in Scotland. And it was about to campaign for the right of citizen, how we live together, how we respect each other, following what I have faced about racism in Scotland. And now the second one is about the UK Rwanda deal that are taking right now, asylum deal that I'm taking now to court as an individual because of what I have faced uh, since then. I wanted the court to establish whether it's really fair for a country like us to take refugee back in a different country, looking at what I have faced in the same part of Africa. So these are the two things I'm doing right now. I'm collecting some fund to, for, the, for the legal fees for that court case, but the Freedom Heart campaign, anyone who wants to be involved can sign up on the Facebook page and it can be part of spreading the word to our community that we need to leave each other side by side. And if they want me to come to their community to talk, to have a talk with them, to explain, to explain what is the Freedom World campaign is about and how we want to make sure that we're building a better world on this difficult time. So these are the two projects I have at the moment, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank for you. everything you've achieved. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> really impressive. I feel like the listeners for this podcast should like listen to you and consider you an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. But I think, you know, we have two big things that is a threat and which is not choosing who is who. The climate issue, The climate emergency, where you see the, is, is the, we have longer summer, deeper winter, horrible autumn, when flood comes and flood comes and, and we have the living crisis at the moment. Not to forget COVID. COVID is still here. COVID is not gone. So all these dangers, it's attacking us, whether you are black, white, brown, it doesn't matter. So if people around the world does not learn the respect of each other, does not learn to install justice, we will kill each other. I think this is the only thing that could help us survive what is about to come. Things, bad things will come to us and us as human, we need to be prepared on the good value of the humanity. If we're just going to be egoist, If you're just going to look at the other because he's white, because he's black, or because he's rich, because the other racism here is black rich, black poor, uh, white rich, white poor, it's become a problem again. So these are politicians that does not want the good of everybody. They want their own good, their own interest. So people need to adhere to movements that change radically and make us peace otherwise. And I'm telling you this today, Alexander, remember this day. People will be tired of suffering. They will be tired of being played by a politician. And there will be a big shift in this world where people just say, enough is enough. And people say, we need peace, we need justice. And those politicians, all this system will just collapse. That will about to come. This is where we're going. I mean, I think that's for the best. It's for the best, absolutely. It's for the best. Because if we don't raise our voice now, I don't know what's going to happen to us. We have children. I have children I still have to raise. You know, but I don't want to leave them in the world is completely broken. No, I can't do that. That's why I have to fight every day. Yeah, exactly. 
I want people to reflect more and more mm-hmm. on what I'm saying and to pass the message to the rest of the world. People need to wake up for the sleep. Soon, we're not going to look at black and white. We're going to just look at how we survive this world. Mm-hmm. You know, there is chaotic situation, a situation that we can no longer control. You know, life is not only about money, but it's about living each other in harmony. That is important. And then that needs to be done. Absolutely. Do you think this revolution would yeah. happen soon? Oh, yeah. Believe me, it's not far anymore. <laughs> it's not far anymore. I mean, you see this youth here, although sometimes I don't really agree with them the way they're doing it. You know, people are suffering around the world. Just people here in Ukraine, they don't have food. Our youth to, to fight climate, they take milk. They put milk in the in the wall. Somehow our youth are going really not to the right direction. I'm happy for them to protest. I'm happy for them to do sustainable thing. But when you destroy what you already have, one the other they don't have, that's not correct. You know? So I really, I really want to see this change to happen. I really want to see, I, I, I have to do it in, in a sustainable way and they have to do it in the correct way because somehow we're just gonna go to one chaos after another. But that revolution, Alexander, not long, it will happen. It will happen because people are tired. People are tired. Where do you think it would happen first? <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> In the UK, it will start here. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about America. America is a crazy place. <laughs> One thing starts somewhere. <laughs> but mm. I think for it to have a good impact, it must start in the UK. Honestly, it must start in the UK. Mm-hmm. Then they had the, they had the will follow. Maybe quicker than the UK, but it has to start from the UK. It's already began. You see what's happening? The prime minister today, the prime minister tomorrow, and people say, "What's what? What is this?" <laughs> and look at what the government is put together. People who are against human rights. The people in the government today, they're all against human rights. <laughs> what is this? It's sad. It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make. What 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 the new prime minister did? I'm I'm still just what. It it, it it what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but in the meantime, you know, people are starving. Children are starving. Some parents cannot afford to feed their children at home. But they're changing government. A prime minister come to power for four weeks, and then after he left the office, he's gonna get paid one hundred and fifty thousand pound every month for the rest of his life. It's a game now. And I told sometimes I tell them, you know. Sometimes I just regret why I left DRC because now it looks like just in DRC. So why did I come here? To see the same corruption? It's, it, sounds, it sounds the same now, you know? Strange. I think there is corruption in every country, but in a different shape. Yes, corruption is in every country in a different shape. That's, I totally agree with you. But when I came here 18 years ago, there was some kind of decency in this country. But now there is no more decency. Now it's just worse. There is no more decency, nothing. Can you think of a reason why? I think it's individual education. You know, if you look at those who are in power today in the UK, they never work. They inherited a million. So they don't know how to work. They don't know how to suffer, to earn money. When they were born, like Rishi Shunak, he was born, his his father was a millionaire already. So everything was provided to me, to him. He never went to, like my, my daughter's 15 today, she worked at John Lewis. She goes to school and then after she, Rishi Sunak never done that. You know, he finished all his education, went for a gap year and came back and then he found the, the, that financial place for him, waiting for him. And he went to work there and then he went to parliament and he's prime minister. What can he teach you about working or anything? Nothing. It's the people that are in power today they have never had the opportunity to create their own destiny. Mm-hmm. Someone like me, who has been in the whole process, I will understand people. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been nothing, no money, go to stage this, go to the, I know how life goes. Mm-hmm. So when I go to power, I will understand here is not going to work in this time because I've been there, I know how it looks like. Mm-hmm. You know? But not this government, the whole born millionaire, all of them. Yeah, it's tragic. It's tragic. I'm mean, telling you, it's tragic. And what is worse, they're making sure that people does not vote them. They're creating system between them. You always be them to decide who's running the country. 
-hmm. Where is democracy? That's why I'm telling you democracy in this country is in danger. And people now begin to realize that. Mm -hmm. And that is where the evolution will come from. Because no one can continue to be played off like this. No way. Definitely. Hopefully it will come soon. <laughs> Everybody keeps saying that. <laughs> Let's hope it comes soon. Let's really hope it comes soon. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Thank you too. Thank you too. Yeah, thank you. It's been really nice to talk to you. Me too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> This concludes our podcast for today. Thank you for listening to our conversation with Deborah and we thank her very much for taking the time to talk to us. We hope our discussion brought more awareness towards the subject of refugees and immigrants and we wish Deborah good luck in her journey. This episode is the first of our new series in which we explore the challenges faced by refugees. Our upcoming guests are Abdul Tahan, a Syrian refugee and comedian who founded his own podcast centering refugees. Dr. S. Shalvan, a human rights lawyer supporting the LGBTQ people who claim asylum. Lucky Kambule, a refugee who founded a movement that has won significant rights for people claiming asylum in Ireland. And Parwana Amiri, an Afghan refugee, activist and poet who will be sharing her poetry. Hey, no.